Well, hello, how are you today? My name is Jeff and I'm so glad you could be with me because today I'm going to talk about a film that was first shown on Mystery Science Theater 3000 on January 20th, 1990. It was a 1969 film called Moon Zero Two starring James Olsen, Catherine Schell, Warren Mitchell, Adrian Corti, and others. Now, this was the Mystery Science Theater 3000 episode in which Joel and the bots try to recreate the 1969 moon landing in the style, I guess, of a grade school play. Now, my opinion of this film may come off as a little negative, but in my defense, the man who directed it, Roy Ward Baker, had this to say in Starlog magazine in 1992. Moon Zero Two was a bad picture. It was hopeless and never got off the ground. We didn't have enough money to do it properly. It was crazy, a complete muddle. And it was undercut by the fact that you could turn on the television and see Neil Armstrong jumping about on the real moon. And he also had this to say in another interview. Of course it was a failure, and to be honest, that was really because it was a poor film. Much of that was through pure ignorance. No one knew much about making space movies in those days. Mankind had only just gone into space. We knew there was weightlessness, but I think we were mostly just plain ignorant. Yeah, like ignorant in the fact that they're using moon landers as space vehicles, even though those moon landers were one-time only vehicles, and when they blasted off from the moon, they left half of that behind. Hey, I know I'm nitpicking here, but you know, for those new to the show, while I'm going to talk about a film that was shown on Mystery Science Theater 3000, I'm going to talk more about the film and not so much about Joel and the Bots. So, Two Moon Zero is a Hammer film, and if you're like me, you associate Hammer with horror. Their film right before this one was Frankenstein Must Be Destroyed, and their film right after Taste the Blood of Dracula. But occasionally they did dip their toe into other types of films. In 1968 they did The Lost Continent, and in 1970 When Dinosaurs Ruled the Earth. So in 1969, the time seemed right for Hammer to make a science fiction film. The year before, two classic science fiction films were released, Planet of the Apes and 2001 A Space Odyssey. So it made sense for Hammer to jump on the bandwagon, not to mention that NASA was sending a man to the moon for real. The director of the film was Roy Ward Baker. Roy lived from 1916 to 2010. He had a long career as a director, working his way up through the British cinema in the early 1930s. He was the assistant director on Alfred Hitchcock's The Lady Vanishes, 1938. For a while, he worked for Daryl Zanuck at 20th Century Fox. One of his films was Don't Bother to Knock, starring Marilyn Monroe in 1952. In the 1960s, he worked mostly on TV, but directed such films as The Quartermass in the Pit from 1967, and from 1970, The Vampire Lovers and The Scars of Dracula, all for Hammer. The star of the film was James Olsen as Bill Kemp, not the person that I would have picked to play a space hero. James lived from 1930 to 2022. His acting career lasted from 1956 to 1990, mostly in television, but he did do the occasional film as well. I know him from 1971's The Andromeda Strain. Before Moon Zero Two, his only other big film role was in Paul Newman's Raquel Raquel in 1968. I would guess that this was a big break for him, but in my opinion, he's just not right for the part. He's not the handsome, wise-cracking hero type, and also I have a tough time buying the fact that Catherine Schell would be interested in him. Catherine Schell plays the young woman Clementine Taplin. Catherine was born Catherine Freiland Schell von Boslot in Budapest in 1944 and is still with us. She played a Bond girl in the James Bond movie on Her Majesty's Secret Service in 1969, but I know her from a Doctor Who episode called City of Death from 1979. Her last acting credit was in 2022 when she was in Rob Zombie's The Monsters. Warren Mitchell plays the evil J.J. Hubbard. Warren lived from 1926 to 2015, and he was a very accomplished actor, winning a Best TV Actor BAFTA in 1967 and two Laurence Olivier Awards. Fans of this channel should know him from the 1958 film The Trollenberg Terror, known on Mystery Science Theater 3000 as The Crawling Eye. 
Adrian Corey plays Elizabeth Murphy. Adrian was born Adrian Riccoboni in Scotland and lived from 1931 to 2016. She is another actor who had a long career. Her most famous role was from Stanley Kubrick's 1971 film A Clockwork Orange. She's the one who, completely nude, gets attacked, raped, and beaten to death by Alex, played by Malcolm McDowell. Apparently, before shooting that scene, she told McDowell, Well, Malcolm, you're going to find out that I'm a real redhead. A few other actors of note. Ori Levy plays the Russian flight engineer Korminsky. Levy was born in 1931 and, at the time, was one of Israel's most distinguished actors. 23-year-old Christy Shrimpton plays the boutique attendant. She was born in 1945 and was the sister of English model Jean Shrimpton. Christy, at the time, was Mick Jagger's girlfriend. Bernard Breschlaw plays Harry, the not-so-bright henchman. Bernard lived from 1934 to 1993 and was best known as a member of the Carry On film franchise. And lastly, we have Carol Cleveland as the hostess of the transportation ship. Carol was born in 1942 and I believe is still with us today. Fans of Monty Python's Flying Circus will know her from, well, everything they did. And the sexy moon dancers in the salon were the famed British dance group called the Gojos. As for the music, a 34-year-old California trumpeter named Don Ellis was hired to do the music. I'll have more on him later. So what is Moon Zero Two? Well, it's basically a 1940s B-Western film done in outer space. After the opening animation with a swinging jazz theme song, Go find the world you're seeking Where stars are new in the making It's time to fly deep spaces calling you We see the moon. Pulling back, we see the inside of a spacecraft. There are two men, space salvage experts inside. Bill Kemp and his Russian partner Karminsky. They are attempting to capture what appears to be a large satellite, but in reality is just a small satellite. After the successful capture, they return to the moon to get their reward. Kemp, by the way, was the first man on Mars and was a national hero, but now salvages space junk to make a living. Now at the same time he's heading off to the shower, a pretty young woman with a bizarre hat shows up looking for him. We also meet J.J. Hubbard and we know instantly that he's our villain. I hope you enjoyed your trip, sir. No more or less than a hundred other trips I've taken. Bill meets the lady, Clementine Taplin, as he's getting out of the shower. And their first meeting doesn't go well. What are you doing here? I was looking for Captain Kemp. Will you go away? Are you? No! But later, under better circumstances, they meet again, this time on a transportation ship that's showing 1940s westerns, but strangely, most people have their back to the screen. We learn that this young lady is looking for her brother who was mining on the moon's far side. Of course, even in the future, all pilots are men, and a new dress is a cure for a woman's unhappiness. Anyway. Oh, come on. It's not as bad as all that. Splurge out. Buy yourself a new outfit. You'll feel better. It seems that everyone is trying to talk Bill into working for a big corporation, but he resists. Not you, too. I just had Harry on to me a while back. I'll tell you what I told him. I'm not going back into the corporation. When they gave up exploration flights, they... They gave up killing pilots. And even if he keeps doing what he's doing, he's about to be grounded because his spaceship is old and dangerous. Men have been getting killed in those ships. They're really out to get me. Not you, Bill. Your ship. But let's take a break from all this to see a little dancing. So Bill needs money, and it just so happens that J.J. Hubbard needs him. 
Hubbard wants Bill to help illegally land an asteroid on the far side of the moon so it can be mined for sapphire. Land it? You mean crash it and that's against the law in a big way? Yes, because some young pilot might drop it on Moon City. Reluctantly, he accepts, knowing a new space ferry will be his reward. And since this is Wild West on the Moon, we still have dangerous types entering the saloon. And we get more dancing. The convoy's in from Fireside 5! The first part of the plan, attach rockets to the asteroid. A 6,000 ton jewel. How would you like to meet the broad who could hang that around her neck? She would be awfully large, don't you think, Bill? Allison Hayes, maybe? So back at the bar, Clementine is waiting. Kep explains that people who mine the moon have two years to make a discovery or they lose their claim. Seems a bit unfair. Maybe, but the moon costs a lot of money to get started. And they can't have people just digging holes and not finding anything. Clementine's brother was just a few days away from two years. Bill agrees to take Clementine to the far side of the moon to look for her brother. But J.J. Herbert's henchman isn't happy with the arrangement, so that results in a fight where slow motion equals reduced gravity. Okay, to make a long story short, because this is actually a very long film, they find her brother dead due to a poisoned air supply. After a moon shootout and a long trip back, in which we get to see a lot of Catherine Shell. Well, what's the matter? If it gets any hotter, I'll very likely take the rest of it off. We discover that J.J. Herbert had her brother killed because her brother had made a discovery on the moon, and if he reported that, he would have been able to keep his claim. Let me get this straight. You got that lost to murder my brother just so that you could have a place to land an asteroid. Not just any of that. Stop. The problem is, that's where J.J. Herbert wanted to land the asteroid, so he had to have her brother killed. And then Kemp's lover Elizabeth is shot to death. And then at gunpoint, Kemp's forced to go on with the plan. On the way, we learn that Herbert wants the 6,000 tons of sapphire is so he can build rockets that can go to Mercury. I'm sure the science is correct here. There's another shootout on the asteroid, but Herbert gets the upper hand. But Bill has a plan. He locks the two bad guys to the asteroid and sends them to the moon to their deaths. Two, one, contact. Well, he made his mark on the moon all right. Now, since the asteroid landed on Clementine's brother's claim, I guess she will inherit the property and that will make her very rich. And for some reason, she's still attracted to a much older camp. Oh, by the way, what's your room at the hotel like? Why don't you find out? And since Bill's other girlfriend is dead, the two can live happily ever after. We finish with that swinging jazz song from the beginning, and we are out of here. Now, strangely, they both lost a loved one, yet what's on their mind is making love in her hotel room. United Nations Space Charter, Section 99B. No sex is permitted in space. Do you make them all up? <laughs> Most of them. Now, this film is 140 minutes long, so about 20 minutes were cut out of the Mystery Science Theater 3000 episode. 
This includes the scene in which we find out that Bill Kemp and Elizabeth Murphy were lovers, and that most likely is why she had to die at the end to avoid any type of love triangle. Most of the other scenes that were cut were just a lot of talking, you know, explaining things that really didn't need explaining, so you're not missing a lot. As for the music, as Tom said, Who decided freeform jazz was the right thing for the soundtrack? And here are my thoughts, and I'm only guessing. Since 2001 A Space Odyssey used some well-known classical tunes like the Blue Danube, the makers of this film thought they would do something even more outrageous and use freeform jazz, but it just doesn't work. Not at all. And what's more irritating are the bizarre musical stings included in some scenes. I don't know. Seven? Ten? Which is it? Seven or ten? <laughs> I'm sorry, but seven means we might make it. Ten means we won't. But right now, why don't we go check out a few minutes of the best of Mystery Science Theater 3000. Hey, it's in color. Yeah. Really bad music already. This is great. Titles by Mrs. Reedy's Third Grade. I was just telling this man. You can't tell this man anything about anything. But feel free to tell him something about nothing or a little about a lot. What did Do you, you want think to see? I look like a zucchini? She no looks like Dot Vader. Nor have we any messages for a Miss Clementine Taplin. However, uh, I believe Yeah, yeah, sure. Don't you have to go make some elfin cookies? <laughs> <laughs> she looks like an Oompa Loompa. Yes, this time we can pay the bill, okay? Okay, okay Mr. Mr. Faulty. Faulty. Hey, I know, Ling let's sing car songs. You know, like the Wiener Man song, yeah. I know a Wiener Man, he owns a hot dog stand. He Sorry. Now those suits are different colors, so you can tell who's who. If she gets uh, confused, she should just remember that she's her. Wow, look at it in there. Your brother was really a slob. Hey, is there air coming out of your suit, or are you playing a trumpet? Whoa, Joel, give me a hand. I'm shorting out here. What oh, is it's just this? just the film. Don't worry, Servo. Focus. Oof. I don't know. Seven? Ten? Which is it? Seven or ten? <laughs> I'm sorry, but seven means we might make it. Ten means we won't. What's the trumpet mean? Look, we've got power for another couple of months. Wait! Oh, the jazz combo is still in there. The day the music died. Now, you sold them as air bottles. You sell all air bottles around here. Uh, yeah, but I distinctly oh. remember not selling that air bottle. You would better answer him. They're surfing. I can fly! I can fly! I'm the luckiest boy in the world! Wow, apparently I'm dead. They'll reach the moon in exactly one minute. Three. Yeah! Yeah! You're yeah! Fire, Sparky. Woo! Woo! Woo Moon zero two. Now, one last thing. I read that a sequel and a TV show were planned during the making of this movie, but this movie was torn apart by the critics and did really horribly at the box office so those plans were quickly dropped. Um, next week I'll be doing the 1957 classic film starring Mimi Van Doren called Untamed Youth. That should be a fun one. I want to thank you all for watching and to those that, you know, subscribe and like and leave comments, it's really appreciated. I mean, it truly is. I mean, it's nice to know the little thing I do here that I work so hard on, some people appreciate. Take care. Enjoy the nice weather if you got nice weather where you are. I'll be back next week. So long. <laughs>